like I said the other night, somebody had a long bio and I said, okay, that's enough. I'm a deputy sheriff and been doing this for a long time and I sit in an important chair and I have the honor of being the sheriff of the county and working with the great men and women in the county organizations as well as our organization. And, and we've said it before and you hear Greg Devereaux talk about it and the board members as well, but it's the partnerships and relationships in this county they're the reason that we get such great work done, absolutely. And, and if it wasn't for all of us working together, we wouldn't accomplish near as many things. And to be quite honest, this doesn't happen everywhere in the state of California. It certainly doesn't happen across our country. I've had the opportunity to visit with folks from other counties and, and, and when I explain what goes on, whether it be HOPE where we're partnered up with DBH or or crime-free multi-housing where we're partnered up with a variety of folks, or this for that matter, the children's network and the incredible things that are accomplished here. People look at me and go, how do you guys do that? That's because we all get along and we like each other. And that's why we get some great work done. And, and I couldn't be more proud to be in this position and have the opportunity to work with all of you and accomplish those great things. And, you know, we've had a long-standing partnership and relationship with the Children's Network for over 20 years, back when these conferences were held at Cal State San Bernardino, if anybody remembers back that far. You know, the incredible things that are done by, these, by this group, um, whether it be the, the child left in a hot car program or drowning programs, and those, those things are incredible. That's what makes the difference in this county and saves lives. And we're happy to be part of that. The Children's Assessment Center, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, is an incredible tool that folks across this state look and say, wow, that's an example of something we should do. Bringing those victims of tragic crime to a place where they can interact with counselors and doctors and the facts can be uh, discovered so that our DA's office and, and our DA, Mike Ramos, does an incredible job prosecuting those suspects that are responsible for those crimes. But if we didn't have the assessment center, we wouldn't be able to put those cases together as well as we do because it's everybody working together to accomplish great things. So on behalf of us and our department, and thank you and congratulations on 30 years of this conference because I think this is bringing everybody together accomplishes great things. So thank you all. And now I'd like to introduce um, Supervisor Kurt Hagman from the 4th District. Kurt Hagman was elected to serve San Bernardino County's 4th District, which includes the cities of Chino, Chino Hills, Montclair, Ontario, and the southern portion of Upland. Supervisor Hagman has an extensive resume of public service. In 2004, he was elected to the Chino Hills City Council, serving as mayor in 2008. He worked on numerous regional committees and is especially proud of his past involvement with the San Bernardino County Workforce Investment Board which is tasked with addressing major workforce issues in the county. Mr. Hagman was elected to the California legislator, Legislature in 2008 and was quickly selected as Assistant Republican Floor Leader by his peers. He served in the Assembly until 2004. Supervisor Hagman earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Psychology at UCLA. He and his wife Grace have two children, Jonathan, a student at UCLA, and Elizabeth, a student at Oxford Prep Academy in Chino. Mr. Hagman's experience in local and state government and as a small business owner has provided him insight into the issues facing this constituency. Please welcome 4th District Supervisor Kurt Hagman. Good morning everyone and thank you for coming today. Um, I'm a little more casual because I have fair days here at LA County Fair for all my cities. So um, thank you for having me and I'm here to just welcome you on behalf of the County Board of Supervisors and congratulate you on the 30 years of your anniversary here of the conference. I think I was trying to remember as a youth chairman for WIB, I think I went to a couple of them, but that was so long ago. I don't think we was here. I think it was in San Bernardino at the time. Um, we know that this conference, the premier inland empire for over 500 
service professionals to network and learn about improving our ability to help children. Um, San Bernardino County is proud to take the leadership role on behalf of our future, and I specifically want to thank the County Children and Family Services, Children's Network, our first five, California, San Bernardino County Behavior Health, Children's Fund, for their leadership and creating this outstanding event, Make It Better Each Year. And what the sheriff is saying, it is a partnership. I know there's so many um, other venues here, other um, organizations that are represented that work together with the county to really help um, our children, those who really need it. And what better calling that you have for public service is help those who really need your help. We really want to thank you. Um, we know there's dozens of workshops. You've got a great keynote speaker that I'm holding up here that you get to talk to today. And um, hopefully you can collaborate and work together and still provide those excellent services to our residents. On behalf of San Bernardino County, I want to thank you for your dedication and hard work on behalf of our smallest and youngest residents, for those who need your skills and advocacy the most. Thank you and have a wonderful day today. I just wanted to mention too that all of the supervisors have something particular that they have uh, taken an interest in. And I've noticed, as I've seen uh, Supervisor Hagman a few times now, he seems to be like the techie supervisor. He's the guy that's trying to get all of the uh, outsourced folks involved in everything that we do within the county through some sort of technology. So I just want to acknowledge you on that. Thank you. And as they've all said, both of them have said earlier this morning already that we couldn't do this. This is a collaboration. And the Children's Network Conference couldn't happen without the support of all of our community and county partners. So I just want to take a minute just to acknowledge um, our funders and supporters. First Five San Bernardino, um, huge supporter. San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. San Bernardino County Children and Family Services. San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health. Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation. The Children's Fund, Kaiser Permanente, Inland Empire Health Plan, Molina Healthcare, Arrowhead Regional, Crittenton Services, and Loma Linda University. And also our partners that we work with on a daily basis, and of course, Dr. I mean Dr. Supervisor Kurt Hagman, who just left, and I think his uh, staff person, Michael Miller, was here, and I'm not sure if they, he still is. I heard Josie Gonzalez, Supervisor Gonzalez was in the building. I'm not sure. I haven't seen her yet. Um, Dan Flores. Um, I haven't seen him yet, but I understand that he is here somewhere as well, probably looking for their name tags. There was a little glitch in the name tag thing. <laughs> we must apologize for that. And it seemed to be the glitch happened to the box that had all the dignitaries. <laughs> so a huge apology for that. Um, let's see. An assistant executive officer for human services, Linda Haugen, is here without a name tag. I think I saw Cassania Thomas, who will be the next uh, exec assistant executive officer. Right now, she's the director for behavioral health. Veronica Kelly, I'm not sure if I have seen her yet quite this morning. She will be the new director for behavioral health. Um, the Honorable Christopher Marshall is here. I don't know if you got your name tag on. He did. He got his name tag. Uh, I see Marlene Hagen, uh, Director for Children and Family Services, and Faylos Hare is here representing preschool services this morning. Um, Holly Benton, Deputy Chief Probation Officer, I see, saw her earlier this morning. Uh, Dr. O, I have not seen. Dr. Teresa Frosto is here. Uh, good morning. And then Stacy Iverson from Children's Fund, good morning. And uh, I think that's everybody that I've seen. Mindy Silva from the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. So thank you all for being here. And now I'm going to get right down to the keynote speaker. And our keynote speaker this morning, if you hadn't seen the posters and the flyers and all the advertisement that we've done, is John Canonis from the ABC hit series, What Would You Do? Let me tell you just a little bit about John, and then we'll watch a quick video before I ask him to come to the stage. Um, John is a child of migrant farm workers, and he didn't learn English until he started school at the age of six. He didn't have much hope of going to college until an English teacher recognized his potential and entered him into the federal upward bound program. 
which put him on the path to college and literally changed the trajectory of his life. Upward bound saved my life, he says. John went on to earn a bachelor's degree from St. Mary's University in San Antonio and a master's degree from the Columbia School of Journalism. A lifetime of never taking no for an answer took John from migrant farm worker and poverty to more than 30 years at ABC News and the anchor desk at 2020 and primetime. Along the way, he broke through barriers, won the highest accolades, and became a role model for many as host and creator of What Would You Do, the highly rated hidden camera, camera ethical dilemma series, which has been airing now for over eight years. John has literally become the face of doing the right thing. Hi, how are you? It's great to be here. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to be. It's wonderful to be at the Inland Empire, I heard. All right. I live in New York City. I want to move here. The weather's spectacular, man. It's been a crazy week of traveling. I was in Memphis, Tennessee yesterday shooting a story for, what, uh, for 2020 and then went to Dallas and then got here last night. This afternoon I'm going back to Austin, Texas to speak at the University of Texas because it's Mexican Independence Day coming up so they want the, the grito. And then from Austin I go to LA and Honolulu on Friday and back to Bakersfield, Cal State Bakersfield next, the week after. I'm tired just talking about it, I'll tell you. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, I do. What would you do? The show that's made it impossible for me to go have dinner anywhere without people freaking out saying, oh my God, what's going to happen? John is here. I'm, I'm just trying to eat. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was on the plane the other day, and I snuck up on the flight attendant going to the lavatory, and she turned around, and we were face to face, and she, was, she almost screamed. She goes, oh my God, it's John Quinones. What's going to happen on the airplane now? It's crazy. It's, so you've been warned. You know how the show works. We can put those hidden cameras anywhere. If the person next to you, we can put them here. If the person next to you passes out and you go get another pastry, <laughs> you're going to talk to me afterward. Yes, I'm very, very honored to be here, really humbled to be here. Humbled because I'm standing among heroes here. Uh, the work you do is so vital to the most vulnerable among us in society, our children. I was reading some research the other day, and, and I heard that every day in this country, 1,900 children become victims of abuse or neglect. Four of them will die every day. On any given day, there are some 40, 415,000, almost half a million children in foster care, and their average age is nine years old. Half of them are children of color. 60,000 of them are waiting at least, have been waiting at least two years for a foster care parent. Uh, we all know the bad news. As a reporter, I've done many of the stories uh, about children in crisis, stories about how our welfare system is, uh, the child welfare systems are all broken and children are suffering serious harm because of that. And that's why the work you do as the Children's Network, uh, your mission is so important. Like all the good people on my show, you know, the folks who step up and sound the alarm and say something when they witness an injustice, that's what you're doing, coming to the rescue, improving communication, planning, coordination, cooperation among all these youth-serving agencies. And I know how important it is because of my own experiences, because of where I come from. As you heard, I was born in poverty in San Antonio, Texas, uh, in the barrio, uh, born and raised in, in Texas. In fact, my family's been in Texas for seven generations. So I love it when people come up to me and say, John Quinones, you're Mexican-American. When did your family cross the river? It's like, we were always there. You know, <laughs> seven generations. We were there when Texas was part of Spain. Texas was part of, of Mexico. I didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. Suddenly, suddenly we're speaking English, or having to, and I'm very proud to be an American, of course. Uh, but when I was a kid, we didn't have to learn English because we lived in the barrio where the stores were in Spanish and the church was in Spanish and the radio stations in, were in Spanish. And my parents, you know, my dad had dropped out of the third grade to pick cotton in South Texas, so he never graduated from high school. My mom used to clean houses on the rich part of town. 
uh, on weekends, my dad and I would do yard work. We charged $25 to do some people's lawns, on, again, on the rich part of town. My dad then became a janitor. I used to shine shoes on Guadalupe Street in San Antonio to help the family, 10 cents a pair. And we'd go to all the, the cantinas, the bars in San Antonio, because the drunk guys didn't realize how much they were tipping you. <laughs> and we made a killing, my cousin Joey and I, until one night we're coming home, we got jumped by a gang, because there were drive-by shootings, there was drugs, and gangs. And they stole all the earnings from the night, and all my rags and shoe polishes, and that was the end of my <laughs> shoe shining career. But when I was six years old, I'll never forget going to the first grade and being sitting there in Mrs. Gregory's first grade class. I didn't go to, I didn't have kindergarten or preschool, none of that. And I'm sitting there and not speaking a word of English. And of course, the teacher back then, there was no bilingual education. She spoke no Spanish. So I'm sitting there kind of twiddling my thumbs, wondering what the heck's going on on the first day of school, on first grade. And at 10 in the morning, the bell rings, and the children go off for recess. Of course, they're in the playground. Where does little Juanito Quinones go? I walked home. I lived two blocks in the school. And I got home at 10, 15, and my mother Maria, God rest her soul, Juanito, ¿qué pasó? What are you doing here? And I said, se acabó. It's over, Mom. <laughs> I like school. You know, two hours, and <laughs> she grabbed me by the ear and drag me back to Mrs. Gregory's class. They used to punish us in school for speaking Spanish. The coach had a paddle, uh, that, and he would give us three licks on the rear end, and the paddle had holes drilled in it for extra speed and strength, simply if they caught us speaking Spanish. Um, when I was 13, my father was laid off from work as, as, a, as a janitor at the high school that I wound up going to, by the way. And we did what a lot of Latino families in South Texas did. We joined a caravan of migrant farm workers, these seven trucks. My two sisters, my mother and dad and I jumped in the back of these trucks. And we journeyed all the way to Northport, Michigan, past Traverse City, Michigan, 1,700 miles on the back of these trucks, um, where we picked cherries, the cherry capital of the world in northern Michigan, we would pick them for 75 cents a bucket. And I remember teetering on the top of these ladders. And it would take me like two hours to fill that darn bucket. And then we did, after six weeks harvesting cherries, we followed the crops, like all migrant farm workers, to Ohio, just outside Toledo, where we picked tomatoes for 35 cents a bushel. And I was a champion tomato picker, man. I, with these hands, I did 100 bushels a day. And that's $35 way back then. And my father did about a little bit better than that, and my sisters and my mother. And we all learned the value of the family coming together in tough times and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps, right? It was a wonderful experience. But I'll never forget being on my knees on the cold, hard ground at like 5.30 in the morning, looking at a row of tomato plants that for a young 13-year-old boy, boy's eye seemed to go on for miles and miles. That's what I had to look forward to that day. And my father, Bruno, was with me. And he looks at me and he goes, Juanito, you want to do this for the rest of your life? Or do you want to get a college education someday? It was a no-brainer. I knew I didn't want to do that kind of work. But no one believed in me. When we came back to school, back to the ninth grade in San Antonio, when I would ask my teachers and my counselors, how do I prepare for college? How do I take the SAT or the a ACT? How do I take the advanced placement classes? You know what they would tell me? My own counselors at my school would say, that's great, John, that you have this dream of being a television reporter. Because I had a dream of being a TV reporter ever since I used to watch Geraldo Rivera in 2020. <laughs> the only Latino, turns out he's half Latino. but. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to be like Geraldo, traveling the world, covering all, he was so cool with the long hair and the mustache and blue jeans. Um, and I wanted to be a reporter since I was 10 years old. So my, t my counselors would say, it's wonderful that you have this dream, but we think instead of college, you should try wood shop or metal shop or auto mechanics. Not that there's anything wrong with those great trades. A lot of people make a good hard living doing that, but I wanted to go to college. And they did, again, what people do on What Would You Do Every Friday Night. They judged me by the color of my skin and the accent in my voice. But thank God for my mother Maria. She was the one who would say to me, Mijo, 
it doesn't matter that you have to wear the same clothes to school every other day. At least we wash those clothes. They're clean. It doesn't matter that you have to take bean and tortilla tacos for lunch when all the other kids are taking their fancy bologna and white bread. <laughs> now we know the beans are better for you, right? <laughs> so we got the last laugh. Uh, it doesn't matter, my mother would say. What matters is what's in here and what's here in your corazón. So I kept slugging away. And that is the key, as you all know. I know I'm preaching to the choir. Parental involvement. We didn't have much in material goods, but boy, what we had in love from those wonderful parents who never gave up on me and who kept saying, you can do it. You're just as good as the kids who live on the other side of the tracks, who taught me to dream big dreams, to never take no for an answer and to never stop believing, as tough as it was. Um, I had a heavy Mexican accent. I mean, I learned English as a second language. Maybe you wouldn't know it now. And I was terribly shy, too. Uh, so I knew that I was, if I was going to be like my heroes, Geraldo, but Peter Jennings, Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, if I was going to be able to do that, I would have to get rid of my accent. So I forced myself to do something in school that uh, I, I was scared to do. I, I joined the drama class. And I tried out for the role of Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. And maybe it's because no one else tried out for the play for the role, but I was picked as Romeo for a citywide production of Romeo and Juliet. Now, the good news is that I got to kiss Juliet, this really Mary Lou Gomez. Uh, I'll never forget. And we had to practice behind the curtain, of course, too. Uh, my first girlfriend, uh, Juliet. But uh, that was the good news. The bad news is, was is that in this very macho school, I had to wear leotards. <laughs> and you can imagine. I'm just glad there was no YouTube back then and the th thing would live on forever. But that's how I got, you know, my confidence built up. And I, I met my English teacher. We all have these heroes. And in my case, it was Mrs. Teresa Gutierrez, my English teacher in 10th grade, who was the first one who said, John, I love the way you write your essays for your English class. Uh, have you thought about journalism? And I said, of course, I've been watching Geraldo all these years. And she said, well, I think you should talk to Mr. Harris, who runs the school newspaper, the Brackenridge Times, and talk to him about writing for the school. So I did. And so I've been a reporter since I was 14. And I became a reporter. And then I became the chief of editorials within months of the Brackenridge Times. So there we were doing all these investigative stories, right? About like stories like why are the teachers parking in the students' parking spaces, you know? <laughs> Tonight we go undercover and find out. And I loved it. And I loved it. And then I'm my other hero in my life, the heroes don't have to be people. It was Upward Bound, the government program that made it possible for me to go to college. The first one in my family ever to, to go to college. And I got a, I had three jobs. I was going to school. I was a drugstore delivery man. I was, you know, I worked at the geology department at the university, and uh, and, and and I struggled. But while I was delivering, when I when I say this story, I got to be careful. When I tell people my first job was delivering drugs, they of course because I'm Latino, they presume the worst. No, but I delivered drugs for a drugstore. Little uh, drove a beat up Volkswagen and took medicine to little old ladies who couldn't drive to the drugstore. The owner of that pharmacy knew the general manager at a radio station in San Antonio. He knew that I was interested in broadcasting because he would hear me in the men's room between my deliveries, reading into a tape recorder, trying to work on my accent, right, and then playing it back. And he said, John, I know the uh, general manager at radio station. If you want an internship, and I said, of course. So I bugged him, and I bugged him, and I got a job there. My first job in bro radio broadcasting for $2 an hour. I was 18 years old. I was a freshman at St. Mary's University. And you have to be from Texas to understand this. But the disc jockey, it, I liked rock music and Tejano music, mariachi music. I liked all kinds of music. This was a country music station. And I was 18. I wasn't a big fan, but I grew to love it. Uh, but at the country radio station for $2 an hour, my first job, was, you have to be from Texas to understand this, but the disc jockeys had horses in the back of the studio, horses that they would use in ra rodeos and parades in San Antonio. My first job in broadcasting for $2 an hour was to feed and clean up after the horses in the back of the studios. But at night, I would sneak in to the control room 
and I would work on my delivery, and I would record on these big tape recorders, and I would read everything I could get my hands on, again, trying to perfect my delivery. The only problem was at that hour of the night, the disc jockeys, the professionals, were all gone. It was around midnight. So the only one there to criticize my work was the janitor, and his name was Pablo. <laughs> and Pablo's English was worse than my father's. So, but I would drag him in there. Pablo, listen to this. What do you think? And he goes, mas o menos, more or less, it sounds like a... And then they let me do the news. <laughs> uh, no, they let me first. The first thing I did was a commercial tag on some new medicine, right? So the first word, you want to hear the, what the first words John Quinones ever said in broadcast radio were? All right? Get ready. Don't blink. I said, now available at Walgreens. Uh, <laughs> and I was so proud of myself, you know? I would call my aunts and uncles, you got to listen at 1.12 this afternoon. <laughs> but don't blink because you'll miss it. And then they let me do the news on Sunday nights. It was really Monday morning between 1 and 4 in the morning. Five minutes of news on the hour. I think we had four listeners. My mother, my father, <laughs> and my two sisters. But I learned to make mistakes. And that's how, and that's what I tell students whenever I speak to them who want my job. You got to start. You got to start at a small market. Um, then I went on to St. Mary's University and I, I got a fellowship to study at Columbia University and got a master's in New York City, which was beautiful. I, I, my first TV job was in Chicago as a reporter there. And I did a story while in Chicago that I had wanted to do for a long time about Mexican immigration, a hot button issue to this very day, of course, with the politics uh, that we're hearing about building walls. And by the way, I think we should be building bridges and not so many walls. But <clears throat> so I, I decided that I would find out what it's like to be a Mexican immigrant getting into this country. Uh, so I, I went undercover and I convinced my news director in Chicago to let me go to Laredo, Texas, actually go into Mexico and find a smuggler who would bring me into the U.S. So I was pretending to be just another Mexicano who was looking for passage into the U.S. I spoke only Spanish. I, of course, dressed down. I told my friends, I'm going to go undercover. To Mex I want to pose as a Mexican. <laughs> I'll never forget them saying, well, it's not going to take a lot of acting, you know. <laughs> so, but I found a smuggler on hidden camera who for $300 sold me a fake birth certificate and a fake social security card. And that night, he puts me on an inner tube and I floated across the Rio Grande, all captured on hidden camera by my camera crew hiding in the bushes on the Texas side of the river. And then I didn't stop there. I got on a bus, because this was a story for the Chicago station, right? I got on a bus and went to Chicago, and I got a job at a restaurant, at a Greek restaurant in Chicago, where we had heard that the owner of that restaurant had seven other undocumented workers working for him for 13 weeks, and he hadn't paid them one penny. And every time they complained, he would say, hey, guys, you got to sleep here in the basement. You got to eat all the food you want. You keep complaining, and I'm going to call immigration and have you deported. And that happens, as you know, to this very day. So I went there, you know, pretending I had just arrived from Mexico, speaking only Spanish. And I, I said, I, I, I applied for a job. And he said, OK, you're hired as a dishwasher. So there I am by day washing dishes with a hidden camera. And at night, I went down and I slept with the other guys in the basement next to the, the dishes and the silverware and the cans of food. And I still wonder what those workers must have thought, seven other guys, because by day I'm washing dishes, and in the middle of the night I pulled out a little camera. And I started interviewing them in Spanish about their lives. And they told me the tragic story of how they were being held as virtual slaves in this restaurant. The next day I came back, this time wearing a suit, speaking fluent English uh, with a camera crew behind me. And I remember we had to chase the owner of that restaurant through the parking lot because he didn't want to talk to me. But the day after that story aired on Channel 2 News in Chicago, the US government moved in, shut down the restaurant, arrested that guy, and got the Mexican workers their money and temporary visas to remain in this country while they worked on their citizenship or their residency. And I knew then. I knew then that those were the kinds of stories that as a Latino I could tell better than anyone. Um, you know, those are the kinds of journalism, 
should be about shining a light on the darkness, but shining a light on injustice and in corruption. I think when journalism is done right, those are the kinds of stories we should be doing. And unfortunately, too often these days, we're worried about the Kardashians and Justin Bieber and what have you. And we're not doing enough stories uh, the way we used to in, in, in television news. But I think when we do it right, those are the kinds of stories we should be doing. That story won an Emmy Award in Chicago. And Central America, this was the 1980s, Central America was blowing up. There were wars in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Panama. And the US government uh, was supporting many of the uprisings and also fighting the communist rebels down there. And ABC News had a correspondent by the name of Bill Stewart who went to cover the war in Nicaragua. He was sent from New York, didn't speak a word of Spanish. He parachutes into Managua, Nicaragua. He stopped at a military checkpoint, couldn't communicate with the soldiers, and on camera, you see them put a gun to his head and assassinate him. Um, it was horrible. Uh, the videotape made air on CBS, ABC, NBC, CNN, and the day after it aired, the US government withdrew support of the dictator in Nicaragua because they were killing journalists, and that government fell. I tell you this story because the networks then, in all their wisdom, said, we should hire somebody who speaks Spanish to go to Latin America. And there I was in Chicago with my little Emmy Award, and I was hired by Peter Jennings to go report in Latin America. So I was in Cuba, Nicaragua, Argentina, Chile, but mainly in Central America. And I loved, for 10 years, that's all I did. I was based in Miami for World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Wasn't he the best? We still miss Peter Jennings. He was tremendous, but he was intimidating. He was like James Bond, this guy. <laughs> and I was a young reporter. I was a rookie reporter. I remember being in Nicaragua, and I, went, I, I had lined up an interview with the president of Nicaragua, Daniel Ortega, right? And I called New York. I had this big exclusive. It was a big deal back then. So I tell Peter Jennings on the phone, he's in New York, I'm in Nicaragua. And I tell him that I have this interview, and he's a great young man. I don't think he knew my name. He's a great young man. I look forward to putting, seeing you on World News tonight. Um, and then I get a call from the president's office in Nicaragua canceling the interview. And oh shit, he got to call New York and talk to Agent 007 now. I thought I was going to get yelled at, fired, for because they had made a two-minute hole in the newscast for my story, and it's already 4.30, the news is on at 6.30, and now we're <laughs> canceling. So I expected to be, you know, disciplined for that. And instead, Peter Jennings got on the phone, and he said to me, listen, John, this is going to happen again in your life. There will be times when people offer you something, and they don't deliver. They back out of an agreement. He said, don't worry so much, John, don't worry so much about talking to the movers and the shakers of the world, the presidents and heads of corporations. Don't worry so much about talking to the movers and shakers. Talk to the moved and the shaken. In other words, talk to the real people. He said, you as a Latino reporter can go into the countryside in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, and you can communicate pe ways with people in ways that other reporters can't. Give that, do that, talk to the real people of those countries, the campesinos, the peasants, who are the real victims of war, right? Who are the real victims of natural disasters and, 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 and hurricanes and mudslides and volcanoes. Give a voice to people who don't have a voice. And that's what I spent the next year, 10 years doing, and I loved it. I was in I, Colombia, uh, I, I was, covering uh, presidential elections in Bogota, Colombia, when by day I saw these kids who were sniffing glue during the day, and then they would hold, go into a, open up the manhole covers on the streets of the capital of Colombia, Bogota, and they would go down there. And I said to the woman who worked for us there, who, who are those kids? She said, they're called gamines. They're street children, we call them street urchins, and they're not any good, they're, these kids are mean kids. They're, thieves by day, but they're runaways, castaways, kind of the children that you often deal with here. He said, those kids are bad news. So there's 300 of them, and they have nowhere to go because they've been abandoned by their parents or they've run away. So they live in the sewer systems of Bogota. I said, 300 of them? She goes, yes. Is anyone trying to help them? I said, well, no, the military and, and, and the police, they're trying to clean up the streets of Bogota. 
but they're afraid to go down into the sewers where these kids live and they're dark. You can imagine the, the germs that fester, the disease that festers next to the rivers of waste underneath the bowels of Bogota, Colombia. So they're afraid to go into the manhole covers, but what they do is they open up the manhole cover, they pour gasoline, and then they throw a match down there to burn them out. I was blown away, and I wasn't one of the reporters for 2020 or, or uh, Primetime Live. I worked for World News for Peter Jennings. I did these two-minute stories, but I knew this was bigger than that. This was like a 60-minute story, like a Dateline or 2020. So I called New York, and I said, listen, I really want to do this story. There's a hero here, a man named Jaime Jaramillo, who's a wealthy industrialist there in Colombia, who by day would look for oil, oil for American oil companies all over Latin America. But at night, he couldn't sleep knowing that there were children, the youngest of his citizenry of Colombia, who lived in these conditions. So what he did, Jaime Jaramillo, would get up in the middle of the night, buy a six pack of Cokes and a loaf of bread and a bucket of chicken, and with a little flashlight, he would put on some waders and wade through the sewers of Bogota to try to feed these children. He was the only one. And when we visited him, he showed me an album full of pictures, children with their faces melted from the fires that the military and the police had started to try to flush them out. New York said, John, I know you don't work for 2020 or primetime, but you should do the story. You're there already, because they, they couldn't believe that I, would, I was willing to go into the sewers myself with, with the camera crew. And we told the story. We met these 300 children. I met kids as young as six, seven, eight years old down there. I met a 16-year-old girl who had given birth to a baby two weeks before. Can you imagine starting life out in the sewers along these rivers of waste underneath the streets of Bogota? We brought the story back to New York. And once again, when we put it on the air on Primetime Live a few weeks later, American viewers like yourselves sent in a million dollars in donations. Sometimes people in this country care more about folks in other countries than we care about children in this country, as, as I'm sure you all so well know. But thank God they did that. They sent in a million dollars in donation to Jaime Jaramillo, this guy who was trying to start an orphanage and helping these kids, and he pulled them all out of the sewers. And they're now, you know, and again, again, that's the power of the camera when it's used in the right way. When you shine that light, in this case, literally on the darkness of the sewers of Bogota, Colombia. And I did, they hired me on Primetime Live after that story. That won an Emmy, and then Haiti, and then I did a story in the Amazon. I won seven more Emmys. And it's, Funny, though, that the one show that I get recognized for more today now than anything else is, what would you do? <laughs> and I'm glad it does. It's the show that, that, that poses the question, when you witness an injustice, whether it's bullying, right? Spousal abuse, a guy putting a powder in a girl's drink, racism, discrimination. And that little voice in the back of your head says, do something. Do you step in or do you step away? 